they need to just modify strategy to a little bit to get a strategy to prime. What would we say? Um, connected. Sorry? Connected. Or till we have a spanning tree. <laughs> Maybe the vertices are still trying to find a spanning tree. Our termination conditions should be, you know, until we have a spanning tree. So instead of this, um, Maybe we should say until we have a spanning tree. So covering the word is right? Good. If I make that slight modification, okay, I'm not, I mean, now I'm playing this game very quickly. Oh, you know, you gave me a card example, let me change the algorithm, which is something I said I shouldn't do. But in my, in my judgment, I felt like the counterexample was attacking a statement of the algorithm that could be fixed quickly. So I'm willing to allow that luxury of changing. And that will happen sometimes. Sometimes, you know, a couple of examples, you don't need to throw the entire algorithm off. You just need to adjust a little bit. So let's say we adjust it this way. This seems to fix your example. What about your example? Um, the previous example. OK. And shall, shall we make a new copy of this video? Uh, yeah, I do. OK, let's make a new copy of this video. I don't know how to do this without the, uh, without the extra mark. Yeah, if we just replace 45 and 2. So what do you want to do? Interchange 45 and 2. So you're saying the edge between 2 and 5? And 1 and 2. Just interchange the weight of them. Interchange the weight of those two? Okay, so let's do that. That I can copy. Oops, okay, that's fine. Um, okay. Yeah, and now we should run the new algorithm? Uh, yeah. Okay, let's run it. So now the new algorithm, let me choose another highlighting color. Orange, okay. So what's, what, will the, what will the algorithm do? It will pick some edge of weight one. Well, there's only one. So it will pick this one, right? Then it will pick, what will it do next? It picks some edge of weight two. I will let you all decide which one you should pick. You can pick adversely, make it pick the worst one possible. Which one do you want to pick? It, just pick one of the two, which one? 10. 10, what is 10? No, no, it has to pick an edge of weight. That's the rule, right? It's picking an edge of weight, you can't just pick 10. But of the two edges of weight 2, which one should it pick? Another, right? So the edge of weight 2 and 5? Yeah, okay. So it picks that next. Okay, what next? Let's pick the other edge of weight 2. So it picks that. We're still not spanning, so it's still going to keep going. Then it picks the edge of weight 10. Then it picks the edge of weight 12, and we're done. You are switching up 2 and 45. That's very deviously chosen, but you could not catch it. <laughs> but that's what you're trying to do, right? You're going to get a force to do it, right? But it didn't. So this counterexample has also failed to break the salvage. So I don't know, what do you think? Do you think three counterexamples are enough to sort of switch over to the optimistic side and say, let's prove that's correct? What do you think? Which we do more? Does someone else have a conference action in play here? No one else? Now you're like, of course this is correct, it must be correct. All right. I wouldn't be that, clever, that, that sure yet, but you don't know. Okay, so let's say we are out of counterexamples, we're out of inspiration. This algorithm is refusing to die. You know, and um, maybe we just need to buckle down and see if we can argue that it is in fact correct. So again, we have to ask ourselves, what is in the structure of the solution that this greedy algorithm is produced? What is special about the solution, or the way we construct the solution? Well, there's really only one thing that's special about it. We are ordering the edges by weight and making them an increasing order of weight, right? So the greedy solution is guaranteed to always pick the cheapest edge first, and the one next to that, and the one after that, as long as you don't create samples. Right? So just as we've done before, if we had an optimal solution that was not the greedy solution, what must be true about that optimal solution? What property must the optimal solution have if it's not the greedy solution? So instead of, at some point, it must have picked an edge that was not, in fact, the cheapest. But if you look at if you look at some set of edges it's picked between some vertices, right? You can look at say, you can, for example, look at the uh, vertices that are touched by what the greedy algorithm picked, and then see what the optimal algorithm is doing. And at some point, it has to does make different, right? It has to be different from greedy. In particular, it didn't pick the cheapest edge possible. Okay.
So now we have that in our head. Okay, this is what the optimal algorithm might be doing, whereas this is what the greedy algorithm is doing. And now we have to see what? We have to see if there's either a way to say this could have happened, or that we could modify the optimal solution to make it look like the greedy algorithm, right? Without um, having to um, change the cost, without having to increase the cost, because we're trying to minimize the cost. That's the game we always play with optimal with uh, greedy algorithms, right? Okay, so let's think about how that would work. So, um, so and, I, and I'm going to do this as you know. Obviously, ultimately, this is going to be a proof by induction, right? All these things are the proofs by induction of saying, okay, let's assume it works at this point up, so then it fails, right? So let's say that, um, let's look at the, let's look at the sequence of edges produced by the greedy algorithm. So the greedy algorithm spits out edges that are part of the tree in a particular sequence, right? It says, okay, take the cheapest one, take the one after that, then take the one after that. The algorithm generates an order, right? So let's say the greedy algorithm. The order it picks them in is E1, E2, E3, E4, and so on. Until you know, they're going to be, as we know, N minus 1 edges. Okay. And now we have the optimal algorithm. The optimal algorithm has no sequence. It has no, it just produces an answer. There's no natural sequence. But we can look at the optimal solution, compare it to the greedy solution, and see which is the first edge that is just chosen that's not part of the greedy solution. Right, so the optimal algorithm has a bunch of edges. They would just pick whatever. But now you can say, okay, is E1 in the set? Well, yes. Is E2 in the set? Yes. Is E3 in the set? Yes. E4 is yes. E5? No. E5 is not in the set. So the op does not pick E5, it picks something else. Okay? Alright, so this is where we are right now. So the optimal algorithm did something, it got some answer. We're looking at the set of edges in that answer in that tree, and we're looking to see which of the greedy edges were picked. Obviously, if you can show that every edge in the optimal algorithm was picked by greedy and it's the same number of edges, we're done. So clearly for opt to be different, it had to have been different at some point along the way. And our game is going to be to say, well, we can change this and make it pick E5 and then pick E1. And then by induction, the whole thing's going to work. Right? So you see that overall plan that you want to apply of attack? So now we have the situation where, so let's draw this, right? So we have some edges, maybe I this would be one, this would be two, and maybe E3 looked like this, and there was an E4. I'm just drawing things right. I, I don't know what these could be anything. Right? In fact, if I wanted to be, you know, the, the generality, I might say that E4 is somewhere else. This is what it looks like. Yeah? Why does E1 greater than E1? Because that's a remix. Greedy is the ones that's not, I would say iterative but they're right? So it's picking the cheapest, the next cheapest, the next cheapest, the next cheapest. Yeah, optimal is way really It's just a way to, you'll see why in a second. Right? You'll see why in a second. Okay. So now we have the edge, the greedy edge that was picked. Maybe E5 looked like this. Right? And op did not pick it. Op picked some other edge. Let's say it was E6. And maybe it looked like this. Like, I don't know where it is. Something different. I don't care. Okay. All right. So now I want it to not E6 or E5 fragments. Right. So now I want to imagine what's going to happen. So let's take the optimal solution, which includes E1, E2, 3, 4, has E5 prime, but not E5, and a bunch of others. This is a tree. It has exactly N minus 1 edges. Do you agree with that? OK. Suppose we now add E5 into that graph. OK, so again, I'm going to look at the optimal solution. So that the optimal solution is some graph here, and I don't know what it looks like, so I'm just going to put a big, let me just um, copy this one, so because we know at least some things about what it looks like, right? We know that it has some bits in this. Okay, and 
and it has a bunch of other stuff associated with it. Okay? And now, this is the optimal solution. It's a tree. It's got other edges in it. I haven't drawn them, but it's got some other edges. I don't know what they are. And now, I decide to put E5 into this graph. Okay. What is going to happen? Yeah, the cost will be cheaper. More great. Never mind. Are you retracting? Yeah, I'm retracting. Okay. You have a cycle. Because you now you have a graph with n vertices and n edges. Some cycle must have been created. Okay? But there wasn't a cycle before. There's a cycle now. What has changed between then and now? We put E5 in. Which means that whatever cycle we have now created, E5 is on it. Right? <coughs> so now we know that opt plus E5 has a cycle in it. And E5 is on that cycle. What about the other edges of the cycle? There must be some other edges of the cycle. So we, now let's sort of zoom into where that cycle might be. We don't know where it is. But it looks like there's an E5. And then there's a bunch of other stuff. I don't know what they are, but there's a bunch of other things. Okay? We can say something about every other edge on that cycle. In particular, E5, if you remember, was the first point at which greedy and opt differed. So all these edges, right? Um, so first of all, None of these edges can be E1 through E4. Can you see why? Another, in particular, then, okay, let me say this a different way. There must be an edge on this cycle that is not E1 through E4. Sure. Why? Because, I was going to say, otherwise you would have already had a cycle. And why would that be a problem? Because the algorithm was not select that force. Exactly, very good. Because the algorithm chose E1, E2, E3, E4, E5, they didn't form a cycle. So if this remaining green portion had only E1, E2, E3, E4 on it, that's not possible. You couldn't have a cycle. Therefore, there is some edge on this cycle that is not E1 through E5. Right? See the reasoning here? So there is there exists some edge on the cycle that is not E1 through E5. Okay? Okay. So let's see what that edge is. Let's say it's this edge here, some edge here. Right? It's some edge. What can we say about the weight of this edge. Why? Right? Our algorithm had a sorted list of edges. And so if this edge is now not E1 through E5, its weight must be more than that of E5. And therefore more than the rest of them. So let's write that down. So the weight of this edge is more than the weight of E5. Very good. Okay. Suppose I now remove this edge from my graph of the cycle. Am I going to disconnect the, the resulting tree? No. Right? Because if I delete this edge, its two endpoints are the ones I'm worried about. But I can still get from one to the other using this new path through E5. So if I delete this edge E, this blue edge, I still have a tree. But what is the cost of this tree? The cost of this tree. So if I delete E, then the cost of the tree is equal to the original cost minus uh, 
right? Okay, but what did we just say? We said the weight of E is more than the weight of E5. So what have I done? I reduced the cost. Wait a second, this was so much wrong. In other words, as we said, if we pick something, right, if we pick something that was not the next in the sorted order, instead of the thing we did pick, and that's why we needed the greedy solution. We needed it because the greedy solution guarantees that those choices are easy. We use the fact that adding E5 is not greedy cycle because we know greedy victims. So you're asking why we need that I greedy and that's why we need it. Also for the fact that we know E5 is the cheapest yet at this point. So that's why it was important to have a sequence. But now we've shown that we could actually make op look a little bit more like greedy and not increase the cost and maybe even reduce the cost. So now our picture now looks like we have opt and greedy, right? And we have E1, E2, E3, E4, E5, E6. And now we have one extra check mark. And by now, hopefully, you can see that this is the kernel of an induction. Right? What we're saying is that if we started off being reasonable, the next step will also be reasonable. Which is the tell you, okay, but the next step. Maybe you think of dominoes falling as an induction. So we have just proved that this algorithm actually used a minimum spike. So in fact, our attempts to prove find common examples fail for the reason. What is the running time of this procedure? It doesn't depend on the sort. What is the right of the sort? Yeah. <laughs> so what's step one? What's the, so what's step one in the algorithm? You sort all the edges. Mm -hmm. If there are n edges in the graph, so this will take n log n time. Okay. And then after that, what do you do? You go through them one by one, right? You add an edge. And what is the check you have to do? It's a cycle. How do you check if uh, if it adding an edge to a graph creates a cycle? What's the simplest way to do this? Sorry? Sorry, a lot of people talking, let's see. So, let's see in the back there, you said something. Just double check to see if you are doing it starting at any point. Sort of a DFS or something. How long will that take overall? Then I just in time, but you have to do every of the every of the edges you insert. So this would take m log m plus n squared time. So the n squared would dominate. You're grimacing, you don't like that. I've trained you to think n squared is a bad number, right? So this is good, yes. Good. So can we can we do better or analyze better or implement better? We can probably use a, some destroying set data switch or something too. There are so many hedge words in that sentence, I don't know where to start. <laughs> we could probably maybe <laughs> would you like to be more specific? Yeah. So I mean uh, uh, Maintain a list of set and keep adding the vertices into the set as soon as we uh, <coughs> add an edge, right? So, like if I add an edge, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm slow. So, keep maintain sets. Sets Man of what? Sets of all the discovered vertices. Main so, in the beginning, what do I have? In the beginning, you have a, 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 you have a null set. Right, right. null set. Okay. Yeah, and then you uh, choose the edge of the lowest weight, right? Yeah. So you discover two nodes now, right? So you put all two nodes in there, right? Okay. So basically, every node that gets covered, then I put in that set. Yeah. Okay. So then what? Right? And then, uh, like, so now a new edge comes in. I throw it in. A new edge comes in. But how do I check for cycles? You can check. Your <laughs> okay. There's a comment back. Yeah. Uh, you can check if both of the uh, when I'm going to add a new edge, right? So I can check if both the edges and vertices on, on the edge right? is if it's already present in the uh, set that I have. Okay. So if, if it's present then it means I'm this edge is going to be useful. If you are adding an edge between two vertices that have already been touched, then the claim is that you shouldn't add this edge because now you're forming a cycle. You're way too trust all of you. <laughs> I told you the first thing whenever anyone says something, your first instinct should be to break it. Why is no one trying to break that claim? 
I'm not saying you should break it or it can be broken, but you should be all saying yes, yes, yes. The first thing you know, that like the copyright. You want to you break it? Alice mentioned that the edge has not already been pressed. It shouldn't be three edges. Because it's not going to be three edges. It's going to be edges. But we only cover an edge once, right? We sort them. So every edge is examined exactly once, right? Sorry? We didn't have any statements to prevent from going to the same edge again. I think that is but, he, but that would never happen. Why would you repeat the same edge again and again? You only examine it once. Yeah, you were, oh, so the thing is, if two vertices have an, or have an edge connected, we can't connect to an edge. No, if two vertices are in the set that we're building up, then you should add an edge between. That's the claim. Yeah? Well, then could you have one with two parallel lines, I guess, and then connect the two? And then kind of create a C, I guess? So I add this edge, I add this edge. Yeah. Now by your heuristic, I'm not allowed to add this edge. Yeah, but that doesn't create a cycle. It doesn't create a cycle. So we broke that one. <laughs> but but maybe so in all these again in all this sort of destruction and, and sort of rubble of our ideas, there's always something that grows out of it. We've always thought, okay, we need to maintain the sets of things somehow, but maybe we need to be a bit more clever about how we maintain them. Because just keeping the set of vertices is clearly not enough. In this case, it was okay to link them. Why was it okay to link them? It was okay to link them because you wouldn't have formed a cycle. Why would you have formed a cycle? Because there was no path connecting them. Just the fact that they happen to be in the set doesn't mean that they're going to form a cycle. So maybe I need more information about is there a path connecting them somehow, right? Yeah? Can you just count the number of edges? Count the number of edges? So if there's a cycle, there's going to be more than n minus one edges. Well, in, okay. So, so let's say I have Okay, how many vertices are there? Twelve. How many edges are there? Six. I added that one. Seven. Eight. Still less than minus one, but still I form a cycle. No, no, you have to. So if you had run your algorithm. You but but I'm not. I, at every step, I have to decide. Right at this point, <laughs> by your test. It's all great. I have but, 12 vertices in I, it. I thought we were checking to see if there was a cycle after we had run. No, because our rule is every time you add an edge, you've got to determine whether it creates a cycle. Oh. That's what the algorithm does. Right? The algorithm that we have proved correct does that. So you want to check it every step? Well, I need to do something. Because I'm not allowed. My, my algorithm proof requires, remember how I reasoned about E5? I said, look, E5 is a good edge because it, adding it did not create a cycle. I have to know when an edge, edge gets put in that it did not create a cycle, otherwise the proof of correctness is gone. <laughs> right, so these things interact with each other. I can't just wait till the end. There's no end here. Every edge has to justify its existence as soon as I put it in. Yes? So every time, so when you select your first edge, then you can create a set of a, the pair of vertices that define the edge. Okay. And then when you select your next edge, let's say it's totally disconnected, that's a new set. That's a new set. And uh, and when would it be the same set? If they're connected. So it sounds like you're saying something more general. So it's basically like a traversal, and if you ever see the same vertex twice in a set, then that would be a cycle. So so, 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 so I want you to so not go further down, but go to the top. You just said, add the vertices that an edge connects. Mm -hmm. And if the next edge connects them, add that to that set, if not, make a different set. Right. You're doing something. Something that's very familiar in graph, in graph theory. You're maintaining something. Right. I'm hearing mumblings, but I would like I to hear it. Anyone? Any, any? That's a data structure, but I'm, I'm doing something specific here. Sorry? Now you're guessing. <laughs> no, it's not like it's something very basic. What you're seeing, and what I'm hearing is, what you're seeing is that you want to maintain groups of vertices that are connected to each other. There's a name for this in the graph. Yeah? Is it called a metaverse? Metaverse? -y? I don't think they're called metaverses, but they're called, well, depends. I mean, maybe some people call it that. But basically, you're, you're creating the the connected components of the graph, of the graph you're building. Have you ever heard of the connected components of the graph? How many of you have heard of the connected components of the graph? Not that many. Okay, so if you didn't know the name, I can't really be expected. I can't really be asking you to come up with a name you've heard of. Right? 
right? The, if you think of a graph that may or may or not be connected, if it's if it's connected, it has one big blob. Everything is connected to each other. The a connected component of a graph is a set of vertices that are all reachable from each other. So, for example, in this example up here, um, this is one connected component. This is one connected component. This is a connected component. This is a connected component. And this is the thing. The key factor being that they're connected to each other. Now, if we go back to the idea of, oh, look at an edge and look at its endpoints, now adapt that idea. What you're saying is that if your endpoints are on the same connected component, then you will for sure create a cycle. Why? Because those edges were connected to each other anyway by some path. You're adding one more edge, you create a cycle. Because you go along the path one way and come across the edge this way. But if they're in different connected components, they weren't connected to begin with, so you won't create a cycle. Moreover, what will happen? Those two components will merge. So it's almost like you start off. So initially, what, are the, what is initially in, in the beginning of a pretty algorithm, what are the connected components looking like? Each word. All of them are separate, right? They're all different from each other. So imagine this down here, right? Now you add an edge. The so two of them get connected. They become a connect component, and I'll think of them as one big blob here. So now I have n minus one connected components. Right? One is a super node containing two things. Now I have a new edge that gets added in. So let's say the new edge gets added in here, right? So I'm, so I have, so my edge has one endpoint in this connected component, and one endpoint in this connected component. Right? We'll work on how to figure that out in a second. But we can do that. Yeah. So now these two get merged together. And this super component has three things in it. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This had three, four, and this had two, three, four. Right? And now you can leave. Now this will actually work. Because you will always be able to add an edge by checking to see would it have created a cycle because it would connect two things that are on the same time. And if not, you can leave. What's left is how you build this more structure. You mentioned disjoint data structures. That's exactly what you're using. But you have to, the disjoint structure to build on is basically the collection of connected components. That's the difference between what you originally were thinking and what you actually were thinking. Right? So I'm saying all these ideas are, they have good things in them. You have to pull out the good things and throw away the stuff that doesn't work, and then you can massage them to work. So this will basically work. So there are different ways to do this. One of the best data structures for this one is called the uh, unified data structure. That has a, a running time that's basically almost, almost, almost constant for update, but a little bit worse than constant. And that's more complicated. You can also do this with a binary, with a binary tree, because you can build a binary tree, merge things up using red black tree, for example, and insert things and then merge them. There, I'll, I'll, I'll point you to the readings on how to do that. The summary is that you can get rid of that squared, and basically you will spend overall m loops, m log n time. So the sorting will be the dominant component. It is possible to build a minimum spine tree in less time than n log m. Log m. It is possible to build it in almost linear time or linear time deterministically, a randomized, in a randomized way. To this day, we don't know whether this is a linear time um, meaningful spanning tree algorithm. That's still over. But we can get really, really close. Very, very close to linear. Much better than ever. But it's very complicated. It's also something we teach in, in our first grad algorithm. Okay? So once again, like I said, with greedy algorithms, the trick is to, it, it's easy to come up with heuristics. It's sometimes easy to break them, and you should. And then eventually, you have to start reasoning about a heuristic that seems to resist all breakage, and how you might prove that it is, uh, it is in fact optimal, by essentially some variant of an induction proof, arguing that if the opt was different, then you could either change the opt, or the opt really couldn't have been different in this one step, and then like induction to say that in fact the greedy solution is optimal. And again, I'm not saying that this is the um, unique optimal. In fact, under what condition will this optimal will this solution not be unique? Sorry? Go ahead. When two edges are the same weight. When two edges are the same weight, I could pick either of the two, right? So that I may not get a unique solution, which is why I'm not trying to claim that I get a unique solution. Notice that in that case, if opt had swapped them out, right, 
then this inequality would just be a, a, a sort of a, a less than, a greater than, or equal, to, or equal to in this case, and this would be the same cost. So it would not hurt opt to replace e by e5, which is all we care about, right? And this case, saying no, no, it's actually better. You should have done it, and not, must have done it. Otherwise, there's a contradiction. But it could also happen that it's just eh, it chose not to, but it could, and that's all we need. We don't need to show that greedy is opt. We need to show that greedy can be opt. That's again a point I keep harping on because that's often a place where it's easy to trip up on the greedy algorithm, right? Uh, that you're worried that, oh, it didn't get the optimal solution. Well, it got some opt, and that's one piece where it wants. So if you look at these proofs where there's lots of breadcrumbs and little signs that tell you all these things, right? So for example, looking at this fact that, well, you know, we said this is better, but it's only better if these are strictly apart. If they're the same, it's just non-decreasing. Non that tells you, okay, that's when you can get non-optimal solutions. So the proof tells you these things if you look closely at that. All right, so that concludes window spanning trees. Are there any questions? Yes? Is the union find the best way to get on the connected confidence? The union find, okay, so this is a good question, right? So, and I think your question actually taps into a, a more general question. So, let me first define the union find data structure before we talk about this, right? So, this is a little bit. I won't say out of scope, but sort of not what I planned, I can tell you. So the union, so any data structure, the first question you have to ask is, what is the API? What are the set of operations that the data structure is allowing you to do? And this is true for code, right? You're writing, you're writing a piece of code, you build some data structure, you have the class structure, you have the functions, you have the way to access, you have the way to do operations on it. The same thing you will ask you, what are the operations? Well, it has two words, so it must be both of them. Right? So the union finds structure. It works on a set. So the, the, what is given is a set of numbers, right? And you are maintaining what they call a disjoint union, which means that you are maintaining a set. So you are maintaining a partition of S into S1. And I put that dot there just to show that's what is called a disjoint union. Okay, so it's not just a union where things can overlap, it's a partition. Okay. Um, and this this k will keep changing. So and and supports two operations. So the operation one it supports is find, find x, determine the j such that x belongs to Sj. What is the identifier for the set that the index J is in? Okay, that's one operation. The union operation um, update the partition so that SJ and SK are replaced by SJ. So a disjoint set maintenance data structure maintains these two operations. That's all it supports. So the only questions or updates you're allowed to make of the structure are one of these two things. So when you keep that in mind now, and you're thinking, okay, my minimum spanning tree and these kinds of components, then what you could be thinking is, okay, I have to check whether the endpoints of an edge are in the same component or not. And that is the find operation, two find operations, right? one for each end, right? If, I, if, if an edge connects to uh, different components, I have to merge them into a single component. And that is the union operation. Right? So any data structure that can support these two queries will solve your MST problem for you. Now you can implement this data structure inefficiently. You can implement it efficiently. It doesn't matter, it's like a black box, right? All my MST needs is some union fine structure. So now I can say, okay, forget that. Let me go think only about union fine structures. You don't need something very fancy. You can do this very simply, right? You could just have lists of things and you could just check the list. It will be inefficient, but you could do it, right? It won't take too long, right? You could maintain linked lists, for example. And a union operation is very simple. You just add the two linked lists together. The downside, the find operation takes longer. Right? 
Or you could maintain little binary trees for each of them, find operation as logarithmic time for a size of set. And when you want them, you just join two trees together and rebalance them. If you use the red, right, red, black data structure, a red, black tree, or some other balanced binary tree, you can actually make sure the thing balance stays and every, every operation will take log in time. The genius of the unified data structure as designed, where well, basically these operations take almost constant time, is to recognize that for this particular kind of problem, you can do much better than a binary tree. But the binary tree is doing too much work for you. You don't need that. And again, this is a little bit out of scope. Uh, I, I wasn't planning on talking about teaching unit find data structure. That's a very beautiful data structure. Um, and the basic technique is, um, let me see if I can remember how this works. So, so find is, so you basically maintain them as these trees, right? And so a find operation is just starting the root of the tree and sort of starting the, 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 the node itself and find your way up to the top, right? So you have a array which has a pointer for every every uh, vertex, let's say, and it points to something, and, and you just go point up the tree to the top to see what the ID of the, of the find the J is for it. And the trick is, when you do this operation, you short circuit it. So what do you do is the following. So suppose I have a structure here. So let's say, remember, I have my elements, one through n, up to n, and they're all, they all have pointers to some tree structures that's forming. So let's say there's a tree structure here, and there's a, there's, there's a bunch of things here. It doesn't have to be binary, I'm just doing it, drawing it that way. Right. Okay. And this is the ID for the connected component. So when I say, okay, which component is one in, there's a pointer from one to the bottom, and I just keep going up the top. So there's arrows on these things. And I go up the top and say, oh, this is here. But then I do one more thing. Well, in this case, it was easy. So let's take okay, let's take this one here. This goes here, and it goes to a pointer here, and a pointer here to the top. I change this structure, and I instead make it look like this. Um, So when I find that element and notice that it's the child of that root of that component, I modify it to go straight to the top. Because it'll be okay, next time I ask, I'll give the answer very quickly. And that's all I do. And when I want to merge two structures, I just connect their roots together. This small operation, this, this little extra shortcut, is enough to make this run much faster than logging time. And that's what makes this so magical. The analysis is quite complicated. But the method is very simple. It's called a short circuit. Okay, and that's what that's what this does. So again, you can use any structure you want to maintain those two operations. That's all you need to implement the minimum spanning tree. So then the question is, okay, what is the best way of implementing these two operations? You can separate these two into two different parts. And I did the MST, now let me worry about this. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's, that's a very fun. That's a very fun thing. I'll, I'll add a note. Just so you can read up about it. There's a mud, it, it came out, I think, in the early 70s, if I'm not mistaken. There, there is one more thing that I think we do to achieve the constant time thing. We maintain the rank of each of the identifier in each of the set. And when we are merging, we only make the parent. Yeah. You um, you you merge the shorter one. Yeah, along. We, yeah. We, we merge the set with the shorter rank to the one with the higher rank so that. Uh, Yes, in other words, branches are smaller. Right. So, in other words, you maintain, you look at the depth essentially of each subtree, and when you merge them, I don't, yeah, I don't make a single pointer. That's correct. So, you don't make a single pointer. When you do a merge, you say, okay, look, this tree has a smaller depth than, say, this tree, right? So, when I merge them together, So when I merge them together, because this tree is bigger, I add a pointer. This I think that's what really, thank you. That's a good that's an important and valuable clarification. I'm glad you mentioned it. So there are two things. First the short circuiting for the find. And then this small decision about which way we decide. We don't just make them have a single parent together. We make one the parent of the other. And those two things are enough to give this. Uh, it's, it's almost constant. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, inverse Ackermann. Inverse Ackermann point, yeah. So the, um, so let's see, I'm not even sure I can define the Ackermann function off the top of my head. Um, maybe I can, let me think. Um, I think I can define like a poor man's version of the Ackermann function. Okay, so let me let me try. Since we're on this topic, define it slightly. Let's just do it. So there is a function called Ackermann's function. Some of you may have heard of this. It's one of these uh, extremely fast growing functions. So we're used to, you know, we're used to functions like, uh, sorry. We can take a number and multiply it by two that grows you know, reasonably fast. We can take a number and raise it to the power of two, two to the x. Right? That seems to grow a lot faster. Right? We can take a number and do this. Right? That grows even faster. It's always like you repeat the previous operation that many times. Right? So to do 2 to the x, you do multiplication x times. But that was the operation for the previous step. To do this tower of 2s, you do exponentiation x times, but that was what you did in the previous step. The Ackermann function is the next level of this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was it. Um, it's something like, so I can't actually easily, you can't write it on a closed form. That's one of the points of the Ackerman function. You kind of have to write it recursively. But think of it as saying that, um, let's see, how would I say this? I would have taken essentially a tower of twos x times. I'm not saying this right. <laughs> yeah. That's why, that's why you, you have to write down the Ackerman function recursively. There's no easy way to write it down. But it's a lot faster than doing power twos. Now, uh, think of the inverse of that, right? So in other words, um, so the inverse would be, think of how far you have to get to increase one value of x. So in other words, the inverse of 2x is x over 2, right? The inverse of 2 to the x is log x, right? So it's going slower and slower. The inverse of a tower of 2s is what is called log star x. In other words, how many times do you have to take logs to get down to 2, which is basically the height of that tower, right? <coughs> For the Ackermann function, the inverse is called alpha x. And I think that basically to get beyond, to get a value of alpha x that is more than 4, you need to have x to be more than the number of atoms in the universe. So, so it grows. It's not constant, but it's there. The time per operation of the union fine data structure is alpha x. <laughs> so for all practical purposes, it's a constant. But it's actually not a constant. So the things that you're annoying, uh, algorithms professor likes to put it. But it's not a constant, <laughs> even though it basically is. So that's that's the short story in two minutes or less of why the union fine is an awesome data structure. Because you can get running times of the point time. It's like I will I will give you some I'll give you some reading to look at for those of you who would like to learn more about this. I know I promised on fair fifties, but there are two to give you. So I'll give you that and I'll give you this because it really is very good. Um, and that, and anyway, to cut a long story short, that's where you get to you know, to end this. Okay. So I'll try to do one more greedy algorithm today and you very cleverly all distracted me, so now I'm I did do it. Uh, you will pay for this somehow. I don't know how yet. But, <laughs> um, but I think that, that basically is uh, our time's up for today. So we will uh, just a question, we've got a minute left. At this point, right, having seen, I don't know, how many examples have we seen of a greedy algorithm and its analysis? Three, maybe? Four? So we've seen scheduling, we've seen, um, sorry? We've seen digital scheduling, and what else? No. It's been only two? No, it's three. I thought we saw two different kinds of scaling. Like this isn't real scaling. 
Oh yeah, so this one here. Um, Two, two kinds of scaling, yeah. So basic time as well as that thing. So we said two scaling on MST. So we see a bunch of three different greedy sort of strategies and how you go about analyzing them. How do you feel about greedy algorithm? If I give you, which I will, I'll give you an assignment that says, okay, come up with a greedy algorithm. How do you feel about this at this point? Do you feel like you do you feel like you can start? I guess that's the question. And I'm, I'm not saying you should feel like you can solve every single greedy. Uh, problem out, out there, and that's probably not going to happen. But you feel like you know where to start because a lot of these problems, I feel like you just don't know where to start. It just seems like, oh my god, what am I going to do now? So hopefully, with greedy algorithms, the idea should be start with some simple heuristics because that's the advantage of a greedy strategy. Something simple that makes sense right now, right? Going back to our original point, a greedy strategy is one where things make sense right now, and then I do something and I do the same thing that makes sense right now again, and I hope that it kind of works out. Okay. What we're going to talk about next is we're going to switch over to a more general, more continuous view of greedy algorithms, which actually is important because it leads us to things like local search, gradient descent, and many of you may have heard of stochastic gradient descent, which is a variant of that, which is a very powerful tool now for doing deep learning. So this idea of doing gradient descent is a much more general form of greedy algorithm, which is very, very widespread across many different disciplines. And so it's it's a sort of a, it's a shiny example of where a greedy strategy is used. To Many places. So we'll talk about that next. But it's going to move away from this discrete reasoning towards more continuous. Okay? All right. So I will see you all on Wednesday. And we'll talk more.